Hello and welcome to The Current Thing with me, Nick Dixon, and we have another great guest this week. You may know him from the Lotus Eaters podcast or his own YouTube channel, Botanica Politica, where he travels to places like Afghanistan, Russia, Serbia, Ukraine, basically all the places you wouldn't go if you were normal. And we'll be getting into all of that, but of course I'm talking about your friend of mine, it's Callum. Thanks for doing the show, mate. Thanks for having me on. It's uh, good to see you doing well. It... it I- I thought it had paused there, but I was like, it might just be that Callum's not speaking because he's just so like <laughs> monosyllabic. He's like, I'll wait for a good question before I say something. Um, I called you Callum because like you never use your surname, I've noticed. Have you noticed? Like, you, you, you've probably noticed because it's you. Oh, it's a you great You never shame. use your surname. It's not on your WhatsApp. It's not on your Twitter. <laughs> yeah, we try to bury it. Is it because it's like it's- Irish? Uh, it's a Goldstein, which um, some parts right. of the world, they don't really like. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's Irish. So I don't know. <laughs> just, I mean, that's worse, frankly. But I just... I don't, I, what I is it, really, Dara or something? Yeah, I just never felt like it's really... You're not sure? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, Callum's good okay. enough. Okay. All right, so we've, we've established you don't know your own surname, and we've done an anti-Semitic joke already, so uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we've started strong out of the gate. Hey, I did an um, anti-Irish joke. So, so I was going to ask you, there's a lot of... Yeah, yeah, it's balanced, it's balanced. Um, there's a lot, been a lot of talk recently about your friend, Lord Miles, who went missing in Afghanistan. Can we say anything about that? Yeah, so I can't say a lot. Um, so he went on another trip to Afghanistan. Uh, contact was has been lost. He's, he's not online. So I contacted the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. After speaking to them, their orders to me are not to say anything publicly about the case and, and let them deal with it because that's their purview. Uh, the reason I'm saying that is because that information is already publicly available and also tells people you don't need to call the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. They're dealing with it. Don't worry. So that's that's where it is. Okay. So when you're going to all these mad places like Afghanistan, what do you do to sort of stay safe? So it depends on the country. There are a number of things you practically need to do. Not necessarily because if you don't, you will end up in a bad situation, but it's just good advice. So take um, Russia, when I was going there, I had to make sure that I wasn't going to run into any problems with locals and whatnot. So you learn some Russian, you learn polite words, as I'm going to call it. So please, thank you, um, hello, goodbye. Just pleasantries, basic stuff. No matter what country you're in, always learn those in the local language. Even if most of them speak English, they usually kind of appreciate it, that you've said it in you know the pleasantry part in their language. Uh, especially in Afghanistan, I found that pretty useful as well. Like, we were talking to the Taliban, and you could end it with, Dera and then they understand, oh, thank you very much. And it just makes life run way smoother. So that's sort of simple stuff when you're dealing with a, a foreign place where you might need to make sure that no one's hostile to you. But in regards to, let's say you're dealing with um, locals who might want to harm you, such as, uh, you know, ISIS or criminal gangs or something like that, then my advice leftist. would be yeah leftist is actually a pretty good one not, not even joking like if you go to colombia and hang out with fark like yeah you're gonna need say same circumstances which is the or, or new zealand if you're like a woman or something yeah so what you need to do if you're going to new zealand and you believe that women uh, don't have penises so what you need to set up is someone back in the uk who can be in contact uh, hopefully all the time and just sort of have check-ins with them so check in with them. I'm going here about this time. I'll be back about this time, blah, blah, blah. Always checking in constantly. And so if there's a really high risk that you're going to run into some leftists in New Zealand, you know, one missed check in is a red flag. And two is you really need to call the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and tell them there are some lunatics here. So there's that. Uh, other just bits of advice for security sake, uh, you know, change clothing, change cars, change hotels if you can never set patterns, don't tell anyone where you're going, and if you are going to tell them something, tell them a lie. So if they are working for local criminal gangs or something, they've got false information. Blah, 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 blah. Simple stuff like that. But that's only if you're really dealing with that risk happening to you. If you're not, I mean, most of what I find is you could be pretty chill. I mean, the best thing in any circumstance of a foreign country is just have a local with you, and they'll solve basically almost all of those problems. Because one of the major problems you really just run into in day-to-day life is people ripping you off, taxi drivers, etc. I mean, one of the, one of the things that still, I, honestly, I'm so mad that the way Moscow still works in this regard is you, is you get off the plane and most airports have like a train service to the city and then you can use the subway. Perfect, that's what you should do. The 
in taxi drivers in Moscow still do this thing where you get you get in the car, you can speak to them in Russian and agree a price beforehand, and then when you get there, they'll just turn around and be like, yeah, 200 euros, please. And you're just like... Oh. The thing is, it's not illegal in Russia either, because unless you've agreed a price beforehand, but even when you agree with them, they just then take it back. Hollow the whining case, but... Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of simple things you can do, uh, but as I say, have someone who knows their way about, speaks the local language, and can guide you is the best idea, but... Other than that, if you're going to very dangerous places, as I said, take the risks, take what you can do to manage them, and apply it as much as you can. So, learn a few pleasant words and change cars like a criminal who's just committed a crime, <laughs> <laughs> like they do in every movie. They switch cars. That's, well, there's that's a reason smart. they do it. I can see you being very... Yeah, yeah, exactly. It works. It, yeah, why not? Um, but the big question, I've sort of uh, buried the lead slightly because I really want to know like, how you sort of protect yourself, but... The main question I always wonder is, why do you go to all these places? I mean, I know you're sort of more interested in just talking about the detail of it, but I want to know, why do you actually, go, why did this all start? You've gone to Afghanistan, Russia, Ukraine, Serbia, whatever. How does this, how did this start and why did you do it? I always had a huge interest in dark tourism. I always wanted to go to places like, um, you know, the DPRK or Xinjiang or Pripyat, something like that, right? And... Do my day-to-day -day work, see Lord Miles in Afghanistan, that story blows up, get him in for an interview. And the the interview I actually did with him, of course, went over his story, but also just I wanted to talk to him about dark tourism more generally. And his motivation is very much a Catholic Christian one, wants to help people, um, stuff like that. He's He said that. But, I mean, for me, it, it is a little bit more so. I don't have a faith I, I adhere to in that way, so... I'm I'm more just wanting to learn about the world and see what's life like, what's the truth of the matter, and hell, it's just fun to travel and see new cultures, I guess. But there's a certain like after Miles invited me to Afghanistan, I found out it was a joke, which was a bit awkward because I found that out whilst I was in Afghanistan with him. I was like, oh, <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Like, I'm sat there doing an interview Whoops, with him yeah. in, in the hotel, and he's like, yeah, you're the only person who responded that actually wanted to come. I was like, you ki you're kidding me, right? He went, no, no, everyone else I spoke to was like, ah, oh, clashes with my work schedule, can't do it, not enough holidays in, in my vacation contract, so I can't, yeah, no, uh, turns out I was the only idiot. Yeah, or so just, it, it's <laughs> Afghanistan, mate, would be a good answer. <laughs> well, you know, most people didn't want to say that. So we did that, great fun, uh, massively enjoyed it, loved the time with him. And then I always wanted to do more of it. So having that opportunity after making a video and it went well, people seemed to enjoy that. Uh, went to Serbia to hang out with a friend. Always wanted to go to Serbia. Found out a bunch of people traffickers operate the Serbian border zone for their profit, which is that you've got Afghan gangs and Pakistani people smuggling gangs that basically run the northern border there in the sense of the people crossing it. So the Hungarians have built this big, proper Trumpian wall covered in barbed wire and spikes and cameras, and there's uh, migrant hunters, is what they're called, on the Hungarian side. They walk around with AKs and pistols and stuff, patrolling it. Serious deal. Like, this is uh, why Hungary is awesome. Also, if they do cross the border, what the Hungarians do if they catch them is just throw them back across, because they've left a few metres of soil, of Hungarian soil, until the actual dotted line where Serbia is, so technically what they're doing is throwing them from one side of Hungary to another side of Hungary, and then the migrant voluntarily walks back across into Serbia. So that, that's genius. Um, that was good fun. And then I'd been to Russia before. I had some contacts there. When the conflict started, I was interested in what's life changed for the, a Russian living in like Moscow or somewhere that's rich and capital. But then also I wanted to do some more traveling around the place, see if it's affected rural life. Or at least more rural than Moscow, let's say. And then I managed to get an opportunity of someone who was going to take me to um, New Russia. So Luhansk. And once I secured that, I thought, screw it, let's go. So I went and got to go see the, one of the newest province of Russia, which is obviously contested with the Ukrainian government. And see what the people's life is like there. Um, what can you do? What's, what's fun? In case you're planning a visit. Hopefully after the conflict would be the wise thing to do. I did get an email from someone being like, I'm planning a trip, tell me how to do this, tell me how to do that. I'm like, yeah, I don't really want to be responsible for that. So, <laughs> maybe wait until it's, it's, it's um, advice to visit for tourism. Yeah, don't do what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, you're advice. I love, um, 
Firstly, I love Migrant Hunters. That's a great uh, ill-conceived reality show. <laughs> migrant <laughs> Hunters, when you said that. That's what I thought of in my dark comedic brain. The other thing is dark tourism. Well, the other thing is, I like that you also went to meet Miles out of a kind of autism. And no offense to our autistic listeners, but you're like, oh, he must mean it literally. And you just did it. That's hilarious. But also, I'm very naive. I was not familiar with the phrase dark tourism. Is that just tourism, but where it's like not fun? What's the definition? <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, I mean, people argue about that, but my understanding is that dark tourism is essentially tourism to places that would not usually be considered tourism. So, I mean, tourism for most people is um, either kind of pointless, and I mean that in the sense of the British family, in the sense that we will all go to Spain to a hotel with a pool and sit there in the sun and eat chips and drink 7-Up with the kids for two weeks and then go back home, not speaking a word of Spanish, learning anything about Spain, but just having fun in the sun. Sounds great. Yeah, I mean, you can do that. I don't really get the point. So there's the other form of tourism, which is you go to Turkey and hang out with some Turks and learn that. But then if you want to go see some more messed up parts of the world, I guess that's dark tourism because there's a risk of conflict or crime or radiation, war, etc. That usually turns people off. So I I mean, technically, there's nothing really separating that from the Turkish distinction except risk so i guess it's just riskier tourism in general which happens to encompass you know quite a lot of the world i mean if you look at i think it's the foreign wealth foreign and commonwealth office we have a map in the uk of places the uk government advises you do and don't go and every way they say you definitely should not go is in red and it's actually quite a large amount of the world and then there's the orange zones which is like please don't i mean we can't stop you but, but, but probably don't do that and that's another like huge chunk of the world so I mean, technically, you could argue like most of the world's dark tourism outside of sort of like Europe and North America and Japan, but yeah, I mean that's the that's the reason I say there's a bit of a debate over it. But it's really just where there's more interesting things in terms of risk. That's all. Yeah, and there were those sort of liberal people who go and like, oh, it's fine in Morocco, and then they go there and they don't come back. <laughs> and it's like mm. you're sort of doing the opposite. Though you're sort of like, it's not fine. I know that, and that's why I'm going. <laughs> and um, it's a sort of different different take on this but you still end up in the red zone but with a different motivation i do wonder because i'm sort of the opposite of you i mean i haven't left the country for about seven years even the traveling i have done i did once go to guatemala but i regretted it it was a bad idea the traveling i've done i'm ashamed of i'm actually ashamed of it Callum, because (laughs) i hate traveling so much i'm like why were you doing that yeah i'm ashamed because it meant i was going against my nature it meant i was like giving in some weird peer pressure that i have to travel that's how much i hate travel i mean i don't i barely leave london now i barely leave my flat so we're opposites. That's why it's very interesting. Not in other regards, but in this one regard. And I wonder, it's why I wonder about your motivation. When you talk about the risk factor, part of me worries that maybe Callum has some weird sort of death wish going to these places. The, the, the West's so messed up. The country's so, you probably think the country's finished. We'll talk about that later, maybe. So you're like, oh, I'm just going to go and do whatever. Is there any kind of dark element to it? Or are you just genuinely interested? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm genuinely interested in the places. Uh, one of the things that, irks me is is of course that no one really understands well I suppose it everything's fine 99% of the time right 1% of the time it could go wrong and when it goes wrong it goes really wrong so I'm not discounting that there is risk in certain places in the world but when you're able to travel about and see these places that the news is talking about for example and you just realize how wrong they are I know we've learned this in the west I mean pretty much everyone who's awake has in regards to anything in our own politics but for some reason, like a lot of the population might agree and say, yeah, of course, the BBC will spout complete bollocks about this, that, or the other. But when it comes to international news, they're probably more on the straight and narrow, right? No, it's ridiculous, like comically wrong, usually. And I mean, this is some of the things like we went to meet the refugees in the migrant camp, right, in Serbia. I would just talk to them. Not a single person had anything of uh, significance that made you believe that they're in serious life threatening danger in Serbia. They just they just have to break through, I don't know, maybe maybe three more borders, and then they'd be safe. No, it was literally just money. It was like, where are you going? Germany. Why? Money. Uh, where are you going? UK. Why? Money. Yep. I, I, you just go through with them, and, and no one's like... When you ask them, there was one guy I had to cut because we, we spoke to him. Great conversation. Spoke English great. And then afterwards, he said I couldn't use it, and I, I didn't want to break my word because I was like, okay, fair enough. He... His face might go out there and he gets trouble for us, right? But I just asked him, it was like, well, look, you've got to Serbia. You've broken through Iran. Okay, Iran might deport you, as he argued, back to Afghanistan, 
He's saying he's in trouble there. Okay, you got to Turkey. Well, Turkey's a bit corrupt. You know, it's outside the... Okay, whatever. You get to Greece. You're in the EU. I mean, the chances of corruption have, are not zero, but they've vastly dropped. That's not good enough. Get to Macedonia. Okay, then you get to Serbia. Oh, you're, you're in absolutely zero threat of being sent to Afghanistan again, if you're not a legitimate refugee. But no, just just carry on breaking into countries. And you, and you, you know, on that issue, you, you quickly realise those guys coming across the channel. I, I just have no sympathy. I think I actually annoyed a couple of guests uh, a couple of times doing segments about the channel people, because I've just actual um, upsetness whenever I thought, you know, think about that topic. And then the same with Russia, because, I mean, there was some lady who went to Labour Party conference speaking about how Russia is going to be really cold this winter and blah, blah, blah. We're going to make them suffer. And you get the news talking about the sanctions and the effect that's having on the Russian economy and therefore the Russian people will be feeling blah, blah, blah. And then you go there and you speak to people. I couldn't find a single person who said that anything really changed. I mean, I spoke to people who were pro and anti-Putin, people who were pro and anti-war and so forth. I mean, there was one lady who was the, the most anti-Putin and anti-war, right? And even she conceded, yeah, basically nothing's changed, except I work in high-tech, so if I want to order something that's high technology, I have to pay about 20% more now. So I'm like, you can still get the product. She's like, yeah, no problem. You know, if you need to get Apple stuff or whatever, no problem. It's easy. You just pay slightly more. I was like, oh. Hmm. In the UK, we're paying not so slightly more So the economic more sanctions hadn't worked. Yeah, but it's like, that's yeah. that's the worst of the worst, slightly more. And I'm thinking back to our gas bills, our food bills, etc. I'm like, that's not slightly more. Like, we're, we're constantly having a new update about how bad the cost of living crisis has gotten today. You know, this month, there's another 10% inflation. Oh, great. Fantastic. Everything's going well. So this, you know, narratives like that quickly get debunked. You get to meet people from all walks of life who, who give you a much broader view of the place, right? Um... Plus, it's, it's just good fun to know more about the world, mm. I suppose. Yeah. Well, I only came up with the... Is it like any... Is there any kind of dark element? One, because of some of our bleak conversations. And just because when people do high-risk stuff, you sometimes wonder why, why they're doing it. But like you say, you're just interested in the world. It sounds like you don't quite have the Gary Lineker view on the on the whole migrant thing. That's interesting. That traveling the world has made you sort of see it very differently. And you see it as they're just making a simple calculation. And, they, and you, so you don't have no sympathy. But you touched on the Russia stuff there. I mean, where do you stand on this Russia-Ukraine thing, having been there? Because obviously the sort of standard narrative is, oh, we love Ukraine, let's have a Ukraine flag and never say anything even vaguely, like Peter Hitchens gets attacked for even saying, well, you know, maybe some of the things the West did over the years weren't that ideal and may have led to this situation. Even that's like you're a Putin apologist. But having been out there, where do you stand on that conflict? Honestly, neither way. Like, it's it's weird. Some people seem to think that I'm not telling the truth when I say this, but I, I summed it up in the end just saying Slavs killing Slavs. Good luck to the Slavs. I mean, I've got no investment either way in that conflict. Um, I see... The, the thing that surprises me so much about that is you have so many people, as you say, in the West who are obsessed, right? And most of these people had never heard... what. Well, Maybe they'd heard of the Donbass war vaguely on one BBC report at the end of the evening, right? But that was about it. They, they have no concept that the war been going on for that long. They have no concept that this is, uh, you know, has cost thousands of lives already. They can't really find Ukraine on the map. They, for some reason, have decided that Ukraine is the bastion of all democracy overnight, like it was the source of the American Revolution. But then equally, you get people in the West who are obsessed with Moscow and Russia, they start telling you that it's a paragon of Christian Western values, and you're sort of like, I have you ever been there? And they say no. You just sort of think, <laughs> where are you getting this from then? It's it's just weird how you. I mean, like I said, I mean, you find these groups of people. I mean, vastly more in the West, you find the group on the Ukrainian obsession side, just because of the way the the state media has made the majority of people take that position without thinking about it. I mean, you do find it on the Russian side as well, just in smaller amounts. But I have no investment. Why would I? I'm an Anglo on the other side of the continent. There's some Slavs killing each other over... What? Who should control this piece of Slavic land? Okay. So I, 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 I get, you know, some people post hmm. about you must be on this side or you support Hitler. I mean, that's usually... The point at which conversation stops, where someone brings up Hitler out of goddamn blue, 
But then he sort of... You're like, is he in this one? I thought he was, I thought yeah, he was I the thought earlier he, one. I thought he was the previous... Whatever. <laughs> and, and then I just sort of posted... He was in the thought, prequel, wasn't he? I'll ask them, you know, where do you stand on South Sudan then? Where do you stand on Yemen? What are you talking about? Yeah, you don't know. Why would you? We've got no involvement. Nobody gives a crap. Why would they give a crap? We live in England. And yeah, when it comes to the, the Slavic one, everyone's so deeply entrenched. I, I just don't get it. So, whatever. I'm, I'm interested in, like, the people, how they live there what's happened in terms of the sanctions and stuff. That's all vastly interesting. And on the Ukrainian side, I'd love to do that side as well. I had a uh, talk with the Ukrainian journalist recently to see if we can figure that out. But when it comes to people taking sides, I just sort of look at them in awe and think, why? Like, if you have Ukrainian family or Russian family, or you have, I don't know, your son on the board of Burisma, or so forth, right? Of course you're going to take a side. But if you're just an average Joe, I just... I don't get what's in it, what's so in it for you. Something our friend Leo has said to me is that, well, it's a proxy war. It's like Ukraine is sort of on the front line for us in the West. And do you not buy into that argument then? I kind of find that a bit weird because, I mean, at that point, you're not really... I mean, if you're just saying, oh, it's a great proxy war for us, though, isn't it? It's like, okay, great. I, I'm sure the Ukrainians will love that. <laughs> so you're, you're being right. used as, as meat shields for foreign policy. It's like, I'm not going to lie. It's not, it's not the most inspiring thing I've ever heard. But... You can have some, some massive geopolitical arguments and people have got massive investment in their geopolitical opinions and that might explain as to why people care about such things but I, I don't get into geopolitics all that much. So, yeah. And your view, you've spoken more to Russians than to Ukrainians but you, what is your experience from people on the ground? How does an average Russian, in your experience, feel about Putin or feel about the war or vice versa? So it's hard to say. Uh, most of the anti-Putin types, as in people who are journalists or YouTubers or influencers or whatever else, they've all left. They left, I think, about the time the special operation began or the partial mobilization because they didn't want to get drafted, which, you know, it's pretty human. Uh, so they're all outside the country. So what I found, they're kind of an interesting, just as a side note, because a lot of people think that they oppose Putin in all things. And most of them don't. I mean, like, there was a Ukrainian YouTuber talking about a lot of them that have left, and he was correct in his assessment, which is the vast majority supported the annexation of Crimea, even if they disagree with Putin and wanted, I don't know, the Liberal Democratic Party in charge or the Libertarian Party or whatever, right? They still thought the annexation of Crimea made perfect sense, majority Russian, blah, blah, blah. It's our territory, you know, their rhetoric, right? Uh, but they've left because of the, the escalation of the conflict into what it is now. Well, the ones I found in Russia... Most people were normies. That's expected. Same everywhere. Of the normies, they didn't care because nothing's changed. So, okay. M maybe your son's been drafted. That's bad. But then it's Russia. That's just kind of part of life, frankly, in terms of your ethnic history. So it, people didn't. People seem to think that that might be it's such a huge deal, and it would be for us, but it's I, I got the sense that this was more normal for them. That it was kind of expected that this might happen at some point, so it, it's, you know, a shame, but not terribly a shame in the same way it would be for us. Um, the ones who were yeah. anti-pro Putin, yeah, I mean there are a few about. Mo most of them weren't really on the train of like he's our dear leader. It's it's not like people imagine it. People in the West portray it as sort of like China or, or North Korea, and the sense I got from that was no, like sure you're not going to go out and protest in Red Square. That's that's not happening, but. If you want to talk to your colleagues about how you think this policy is stupid and you can't stand him and the blah, 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 that's allowed. No one's going to come knocking at your door by the sounds of it. I mean, if you go trying to organize stuff, you might get in trouble. But, you know, it's Russia. Um, I, I didn't really find much in the way of huge care about him. I found more in the, the conversations was about our Russians. So it was an ethnic argument of like, well, look, regardless of what you think, if these people want to be with us, if they're ethnic Russians, then we should help them and make them join with us. That was the argument I heard from Russian nationalists who viewed it as a good thing. And what they saw as a good thing was not taking everything. They saw as a good thing of taking the lands that have large Russian populations because they don't deserve to uh, be under Ukraine if they don't want to. That's their version of events. But other than that, yeah. Hmm. And... um. Is it, is it a problem in Russia that you kind of look a bit like Zelensky? 
So there's some interview you did. You had a green T-shirt and you looked you look like Zelensky. And I was yeah, thinking, I, like, Callum's got to be careful going around some of these places. I'll be honest. Before I left, I was like, should I bring the? Uh, no, I'm not going to leave that one here. I don't. I don't need that T-shirt. So yeah, and, 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 and it never came green. up. <laughs> um, but on a serious note, so you've sort of um, a couple of things there. I mean. Yeah, you said that going there had almost made you more stoical because almost like they're sort of like it's Russia, like the kind of bleakness of life there had made you more stoical. And the other thing I remembered is that when you say that not much has changed, you sort of said that the McDonald's are like had to change its name, but it was still basically McDonald's. Yeah, I mean that's one of the insane things when it comes to sanctions. It's like, oh man, we've taken away McDonald's. I oh, really have you. Where does the McDonald's in Moscow get its meat? Russia. Where does it get its bread? Russia. Where's it get the pick? Okay, so all of the ingredients come from here. The tea comes from China. Sorry, from India. Great, they're they're not sanctioning us. So all the products are the same. The fries are the same. They're all making that stupid beeping noise. Um, all of the materials to make everything were already situated in Russia. So what's happened is that Igor, or whoever owns its Tasty, full stop, which is the new name, we're just going to call it McDonald's Russia now. They don't have to send that 10% of profit to McDonald's USA. Instead, Eagle gets to keep it. So, and if you think, okay, well, still, it was great that McDonald's took that stance. Dude, Burger King's still there. Starbucks is gone. Costa's still there. KFC's still there. Like, it, It's really weird to think this would have a huge effect. And it's it's weird to think that for some reason, every company would do this. I mean, Burger King in Russia must be actually pissing themselves how funny this is for them. Like, our main competitor is leaving. Why? Um, war in Ukraine. Huh. What do you care about? Money. Yeah, I care about money too. Okay, let's make money instead. I mean, I don't know what to say. It's just it's just kind of silly. Yeah, and it had some... Fu- what's, the, what's it called, McDonald's there? It was called Muck something else, wasn't it? It's called It's Tasty, with a full stop. Right. Oh, I can't. I thought you. I thought you went somewhere where they had McDonald's, but just had a weird, like, almost identical name, and everything was like oh, really right. similar. Yeah. So that's that's the Russian Federation. So in Luhansk, which ah. is you know the old Ukrainian provinces now, Russian provinces, um, um, as being mm. held, they have. Yeah, I don't even know enough about it to know which bits of this interview are controversial. By the way, I know Luhansk <laughs> is one of the controversial. But I'm so embarrassingly ill-informed. You might have just been saying stuff that's shocking everyone. I'm like, oh, interesting. But anyway, so, so in the Russian Federation bit, you were saying. Yeah, so in, in the old Russian Federation, as it's traditionally known, there's um, it's tasty full stop. And in Luhansk and the new provinces, they still got the um, McDonald's style. But like for Luhansk, I mean, that city's been at war for years. So the, the McDonald's there, I think the owner um, kept it, but then realized he kind of has to do something with the place. So it's got the, it's actually kind of cute. It's got like the old style um, outside, you know, with like the hut thing it's hard to explain like the inside is kind of the old style interior design just because they've been at war for so many years it's 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 retained because he's he's not done any of that up. like the machines still make the and same know, noises they did right and i know this is such an english thing going around trying to find McDonald's, but because i wouldn't trust a lot of food because i've got a dodgy stomach but i also saw another one where you were in a like a mcdonald's with like wood paneling on the outside then inside it was like nice tables was that serbia and you were just like you're like oh yeah. this is really nice <laughs> It turned out it was like is that an the same old, one. Or is that a different one? That's in Serbia. That was like an old eatery club or something. Uh, right. It had like stained glass windows, and I mean that's one of the reasons I always try and check out the McDonald's is just a great example of Western brand in foreign place, right? Because you get to see mm. what they're offering them that they don't offer us, and also you actually get a point of reference. I, I got shouted out for not talking about like Russian um, dumplings and reviewing those and etc. And I ate them and they're great. But if I sit here and tell you about the, whether the dumplings are good or not, you don't really have a point of reference usually to the local food, but that yeah. works. So, I mean, when you go to a Serbian McDonald's and you see they've got stained glass windows, and then you go to Muk Duck in Luhansk, which is, you know, apparently been at war for eight years, and they've got more cushioned seating than we do. I mean, it does kind of annoy me. That's the one I, I was on like, about, Muk Duck. That's the one I was on about. That's the one in Luhansk, yeah. He's renamed it to be like, I think it's Daffy Duck is the mascot now. And um, all this stuff has McDack written on it. One of the things, though, is like you go to McDonald's, like just down the stolen road. two basically iconic brand names. <laughs> what are they going to do? Sue him? Good luck. <laughs> but the yeah, McDonald's yeah. down the road, like they have just this plastic seating, hurts to sit on. There's no plastic straws. These crappy wood, paper straws are not even wood. I just 
Then you go to the foreigner land and they've got all the things still, and you just think, what are we doing? Why are we bothering? Decline of the West. Yeah, I know it's small. It might be minor, but I'm, I'm so annoyed <laughs> at, the, at the lack of care of the quality of life that the West has because they're willing to sacrifice it for the sun god or whatever else this week. No, it's, it's one really like English aspect that I love of your videos. You're like, bottle of vodka, one quid. And then you're like, Stella, 10p. Like you're just going around like checking how much alcohol is, how much McDonald's is. It's hilarious, man. Yeah, you're like dumplings. I'm, mate, I'm, <laughs> I'm just drinking vodka and eating McDonald's. Um, what about this bit I do know is controversial. We probably can't talk about any of this. What about your time chilling with the, the Wagner group or <laughs> Wagner group? Can we talk about that? Or is that like totally off? off yeah, limits? I mean, I never, I never really got to the end of that. So the, the guy with the mustache who was leading me around Luhansk. So he was basically a friend of a friend of a friend. So, I mean, at that point, I sort of don't really know him that well. Um, he was called Evgeny. He had a Telegram channel, had shown me what he'd been up to in uh, Luhansk. He told me that he'd been fighting for years. His family were there. I met them. They were great. Uh, they've been fighting for years as well. I mean, one of the days they were off fighting and he had to be stuck with me. Uh, at one point, he also mentioned he'd been fighting in Syria. And at that point, I was a bit like, if that's a mistranslation or you've been up to something. And then in a lot of his um, Telegram channel, he's got like Wagner music. And for people who don't know what Wagner is, it's a Russian mercenary group that's run by one of Putin's men. And um, they're very controversial because they, they do a lot of controversial things. Um, so I, I never really figured out whether or not he's a member of them or not. I, I'd love to go and interview them. They have offices in St. Petersburg now. One of their guys actually was playing uh, Hoi 4 the other day, which is a military simulator game. And he was playing as Russia invading Ukraine. It was just like, oh, fuck off. <laughs> that they, um, yeah. yeah. I suppose I'll talk not, about some these of These are the guys that they're... they're, they're yeah, their logo, they're not their logo, they're sort of, they're, tell, they're sort of, I don't know what you call it, their trademark is a, is a sledgehammer and a guy, in, a guy in the EU handed it over to someone in a violin case just to let him know, you know, we, we see you, bro, sort of thing, some sort of scary sign. So there's a bit of history in there. So in Syria, they had um, Russians who had joined ISIS. Their operations in Syria, I think, are, are largely seen, even with the controversial tactics. Um, at least at the time, they were seen by the West as good. We were happy to see the Russians killing ISIS, even if they were uh, attacking the Syrian opposition as well. They were backed by the West, but the ISIS stuff everyone was cool with. So they'd occasionally find like a Russian Chechen or something, right? Who is in the Muslim part of Russia. And they'd gone and fought for ISIS. If they find him, he's not just an enemy combatant. He's a traitor. So they, and the thing about any military organization, I'll say pallid military organization, but also a lot of military ones, which is not usually in the West anymore, you keep the worst punishments for traitors. You're, you're not going to sit there and have the worst punishment you can think of just be done to any spy you've got from a foreign country, right? No, 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 no. That's not good. That's, that's a waste of time. You have to keep the worst stuff for the traitors so that everyone in your ranks knows not to break as a, as a good sign and also, you know, a bit of a stick to make people not do that. And so for the IRA, for example, there's some great stories about what they do with touts, which is what they call their traitors. Which is you'd electrocute them, uh, rip their fingers off, break their hands with hammers, and etc. And then once they confess, bullet in the head. And that's reserved for someone who left, and they get the worst treatment. And so the Wagner group, um, as it was explained to me, keep their worst treatments for their traitors. So one guy in Syria, they, they cut off his... Well, no, firstly, they bashed off his legs with hammers, and then they cut off his legs, and they cut off his arms, and then cut off his head, and strung up the torso and set fire to it, filmed all of it and put it online. I was like, okay, that's pretty extreme. <laughs> and then um, they did some other stuff. So they started having people who had fought for the Russian army, who defected to the Ukrainian side, who they uh, captured or so forth. And they'd have them explain what they've done and how they've betrayed the motherland and then sledgehammer to the head. And it sort of became a symbol in that regard. And so when the EU declared them a terrorist organization, the... EU was sent a sledgehammer with their logo on and fake blood on it. And yeah, it's it's obviously kind of a death threat, but everyone I tell that to in England, just whenever I tell them the story, they're just like, ah, oh, it's good banter. <laughs> it's like, okay. Well, yeah. I, don't know who you, I don't know who your friends are. Well, I do know they're, 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 they're the Wagner group. <laughs> I mean, no one's going to mess with Callum after this. I mean, the only question is why they needed fake blood. I mean, you'd think they could probably get some real blood by the sounds of it. But, um, it might have been real, I don't know. Up. But you were hanging out... 
Yeah. You were hanging out with a fr- basically a friend of a friend of a friend in Russia who might have been associated with the Wagner Group. And you're like, oh, this is fine. See what I mean, Callum, about getting yourself into risky situations. Well, they've got like a... It's a huge thing as well, though. Like I found there's propaganda post... Sorry, recruitment post. There's not propaganda where you take like a number off the thing. And they're like all over the place in Rostov. So they're looking for recruits. When you're in Luhansk, you'll find like a Wagner branded cola. Like I tried the Wagner cola and a Wagner branded merch and stuff. It's kind of weird. They've become like a, a meme in Russian society, it seems. And they've got some really edgy songs, which I'm not going to lie, are pretty bopping. Like they're actually a good listen for uh, like military <laughs> songs, right? They're, they're pretty extreme, yes. but you know. I was going to ask about your songs. You've got a whole, I mean, firstly, not enough mercenary groups have their own cola and their own branding. I've always said this. Secondly, you've got a whole bit on your YouTube channel called My Dog Shit Tasted Music. And you just have like <laughs> a weird obsession with like military music. What is wrong with you? Someone Where does this come researching? from? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I do, oh, I do loads of research for my <laughs> interviews, mate. Don't worry. Just because we're, we're best mates doesn't mean I don't do a deep research. I no, because also it. when I called you up the other day, you were like, I'm just listening to stupid bollocks. Like, I was like, Caleb, why are you always listening to Serbian war music? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a whole other conversation. I never really liked... And that got like millions music. of views, didn't you, on that? You got like millions of views for your Serbian... Didn't you get like 7 million views or something, man? Yeah, I got deleted twice. The... And um, so, I mean, in total, I got like... I think well over a million and a half. I think it's a, the current one's a 600k or something. I can't remember. But the thing about the, the music is that I just, I can't stand pop music. Western pop music is absolute trash. It's it's not even good to listen to. The lyrics are awful. Usually these days it's propaganda as well for degeneracy. And it's it's just, uh, I don't want to listen to that. But <laughs> you sound like Travis Bickle, Callum. I said never go full Travis Bickle. Like, you know, a taxi driver. You, bit of a boomer reference for you, but you sound like, oh, it's degeneracy. And one day a real raid's going to come and wipe all this scar off the street. <laughs> Well, that, that, well, that's the thing. You go and check out... I mean, there are some meme music that I got interested in. I mean, like, the Serbian stuff's the funniest one, where it's just from this genocidal era of Yugoslavia, and the, the lyrics are fucking gold for, for most of them, even if the noise is unbearable. And so those are really funny. And then once you've listened to something enough, you kind of like listening to it in the same way that mothers who listen to the same stupid songs that their kids want to hear constantly end up singing Baby Shark, unironically because it's, it's just stuck in their head, right? Kind of like indoctrination. Yeah, so then, I, I mean, the big one for that is I tried to really get my head into North Korean understanding, so I listened to so much North Korean music. I absolutely, I can't, I love their orchestras at this point. Genuinely, it's really impressive, though. It's not just, oh, you listen to it enough times. Like, they have um, hordes of musicians. I mean, there's about, like, four bands, really, who have mastered their instruments. Sure, they only play about, like, 20 songs that are permitted, but the ones they can play, damn, they can play good. So there's that. And then you get into... I mean, there's there's cool stuff on the Ukrainian side of this. I probably should send you... I'm making a playlist of Ukrainian and Russian songs. Because uh, whenever there's a Russian conflict, there's great music that comes out of it. I mean, there's there's so yeah, much great Russian stuff. I can't wait stuff. to hear that. <laughs> there's so much great stuff from, like, the Russian invasion of Afghanistan or the Chechen Wars. Um, a lot of it's sad because, you know, Russia. But a lot of it's just, just, just cool. And then the same thing with the Russian-Ukraine conflict. I mean, both sides have made some really cool bangers. So, I mean, that, that's really my involvement in the whole thing, which is like, I don't care about either of you, but you make some damn good songs, and I'm here for them. I, you're right about the, the mercenary yeah. thing, though. Because I, I spoke to this Ukrainian journalist, and I was asking, so, I mean, has that happened in Ukraine? Like, have you guys made a, a meme out of, I don't know, like the Azov Brigade or something? And she was like, no, no, we haven't done any of that. I'm like, damn, because that would be really cool. Like, you guys should, like, I don't know if it should be the Azov Brigade, but, like, someone... They're leaving a lot of money on the table, is what you're saying, Colin. <laughs> yeah, essentially. I mean, like, the, the Wagner brand has been put to interesting use in Russia and probably will be a thing for, like, years to come, regardless of what happens. And, I don't know, it's just kind of funny. Like, regardless of the things they've done, it's, <laughs> it's you know... They, yeah, we um... think it's funny. The listener might be horrified. At the idea of you going over being a kind of branding expert for mercenary groups. <laughs> well, it's the same with, kind of, yeah. Anyway, carry on. It's like the, the, the Panther guys in Serbia, the, the guy who like held up a baby tiger. And um, those guys, you know, committed a lot of war crimes. But god damn, that was interesting branding. Like, I, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. There's this guy, he stood there, I think he's Arkan. He's got a tank behind him, like 50 guys on the tank all in balaclavas with AKs. I mean, that's already a cool image. And then he picks up, he's like, oh, wait, wait, before you take the photo, walks off, comes back. He's got a baby tiger. He's holding it by, like, the rough. Uh, hands it up, and then goes, right, okay, 
take the picture. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 just something. I, it, it's the thing about war. You end up with some absolute lunatic situations, and I I, I can't stop them. I I can't change the course of events, but I I can witness it, and that's what I'm here for. I'm here to witness things. Yeah, you try and be an objective witness. I get that. And did you ever? And seeing some of the dark humor in it as well. But did you ever um, want to be in the military? It seems like you're kind of into military stuff. Let's put it mildly. I don't think any boys not wanted to be in the military. I think everyone grows up wanting to be in the military someday. No, I, no? I, I didn't. <laughs> I wanted yeah. to play guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not all... You, you just assume... It, okay. You think, Callum, you just assume stuff you do is normal. <laughs> you assume <laughs> what you do is normal, but it's not. And I'm here to just point that out. Do it very gently, <laughs> but just get to know more about your motivation. No, I think... <laughs> I don't know. I I mean, I I've, I've looked at it a few times. Like I went to the, um, what's it called? Like the not the barracks. Like the I don't know what the word is. Like the recruiting place. A few times to have chats. I don't want to serve in the British Army at all, especially after what we've been through. You'll know this. Maybe people don't. They actively discriminate against white men on every single branch, um, for recruitment options to even get jobs at basic levels. And so, to hell with them. Why would I fight for The that? RAF was particularly controversial recently. Yeah, but the thing is, people think that one story came out of nowhere. I was getting leaks for ages from people within the forces whenever I'd do a story about this. I mean, the, the best ones were always from the RAF because they were the most insane. But the army and the navy as well is just full of BS constantly. Openly racist stuff against white people. And it's just like... I mean, it's hard enough to go work for ICBM or, or whatever, right? butchered that that's a that's a rocket uh go work for some company where they're chatting to you about how bad white people are like that's that's demoralizing to work for but to have the company also ask that you give up your life it's just not worth being a part of if, if they're gonna yeah, openly you say that you're back. we hate like, you for who you are will you now die for us you're like nah, get a hell all right so yeah. yeah i'm definitely not interested and i'm probably getting too old at this point for even being accepted that's fair enough. I feel like we've uh, just not done enough on your Afghanistan trip because it got 2.6 million views on your YouTube. And that's a lot. And uh, in, obviously, you had that really funny thumbnail of like tourism in Afghanistan, which is you sort of eyebrow raised, like, what have I got myself into? But uh, <laughs> they get incredible views. And um, what, can you briefly give us something on that? Because we've talked so much about Russia and so on. Like, what was the main takeaway from Afghanistan? Yeah, so I mean, that one, I got to spend far more time there than I did in the other ones and then the same place. So I really got to know the people who were there, have deep conversations about what the place was like before and how it is now. So that's why I think that was, um, it was a lot more fun and it was a lot more um, enlightening than some of the others. Not that I didn't try with the others, it's just the time restraints. So I got to speak to military personnel who were now working as um, private security and some other people who had done other things uh, within the old regime or whatever else. And the, the big takeaway from that and learning the facts and reading the reports that the soldiers have been reading for ages, you very quickly realized how doomed that all was and how friggin' stupid it was. I mean, we were paying, like the West, we're paying for half of their national budget every single year. That isn't a country, that's a puppet state. But that is something we're literally just throwing money into and hoping it'll pay off Sunday. And what, it had been 20 years, it still wasn't paying off? It was like, right, I, I mean, this is almost a colony at that point. I mean, sure, they had their own parliament that was, you know, running elections and stuff. Uh, the Afghans I met didn't have any trust of those elections, in case you're wondering. I mean, one, what you know people talk about a lot about elections in the West. They had an election in Afghanistan. They had to wait one year for, for, for the results. Hmm. Yeah, safe yeah, a bit, safe a and secure. A vote counting going on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We just need to count them again. Uh, yeah, we'll be with you just, in the eight more months. Just one year, and then we'll find out who the president is. It was like, huh. Hmm. Yeah. So imagine how long Trump would be going on about that if it happened to Trump. The, so they anyway, had these on. Yeah, they had these complaints that were it seemed to be the case that the place used to be far more violent, not just in terms of terrorism, but the sh disrespect, like the the locals not all locals, just a minority obviously. But there was always a sense that if you were a westerner, locals were hostile to you, maybe they'd spit at you, maybe they'd just not want to talk to you and stuff, and that was consistent because well you're an occupying force. And people saw it that way. And the old government wasn't very legitimate because, well, the West is paying for their existence. And as soon as the West is gone, this whole thing collapses and everyone knows it. 
so it was kind of ridiculous by the sounds of it. Regardless of how much you want to sit and talk about Afghans' women rights, okay, fine, go get a gun and give it to your wife and send her to go and do the fire. She's not going to. No one is. Like, it's a waste of time. People sit there and talk about this. Like, it's going to change. And, well, the case is then, if the West is not really doing any good here, by the sounds of it, and the British Army agreed, that's why we left in 2014, the Americans stuck around for, like, seven more years, for God knows what reason, well, who should run Afghanistan? Well, there's two answers to that question. Like it or not, there are two groups that have the ability and the legitimacy by force to control Afghanistan and implement law. And it's either the Taliban or ISIS. So pick one. Tricky. It's I mean, like picking is... between Biden and Kamala Harris. Yeah, I mean, this this is the thing people don't seem to get talking about that subject. They're like, yeah, but I, I, I'm a liberal and I think it should have liberal values and women's rights. And it's like... I, I want to be a billionaire. Yeah, Shut it's up. not going to. Like, it's just what it's what flavor of non women's rights it's going to have is basically <laughs> what you're saying. Do you, yeah, do you so want I mean, the guys with the guns or the the other guys with the guns who also cut your head off? That's basically sort of what you're saying. George Galloway actually gave a speech. I can't remember where he gave it. it might have been on like a TV channel or some debate in Parliament, right? And he mentions the the one day the Taliban will be seen as the moderates in the fight. We're living it. Because when you were there, there were ISIS attacks every single day against the Taliban government, and the Taliban were keeping us safe and doing a great job of it. There were guys every, literally every couple of hundred meters with guns, running checkpoints, or sitting there and um, you know patrolling the place or something like that, right? It was actually really funny. At, at some point, I was like, do we really want to leave this stuff in the car with the windows? You know, people can see in. They're probably going to steal stuff. I don't know if you noticed. Not everyone here is very rich. And Miles kind of looks at me like I'm an idiot and just like, it'll be fine. And then we go in and we eat some food and we come back out and the car is untouched. And I think to myself, huh, that's weird. And then I look around and there's like five Taliban guys with guns. And I'm like, yeah, it's not so weird. I mean, the punishment for stealing is um, a limb. So yeah, no, no one stole anything. Didn't witness any crime. The, the locals there who had been there before were like, yeah, crime is way down. Um, so that's that's their word so for it. You're making a kind of a pro law and order case for the Taliban, Callum. Is that what you're? Is that where you're going with this? Well, you, that's the revealing thing, though, right? Is you can sit and whine about liberal ideology as much as you want. It does not matter. Like there, are, there are Afghans in Afghanistan who want that. There are Afghans who are out of Afghanistan who want that to return to Afghanistan. Great, wonderful. Have your debates. I do not care. No one cares because that's not what reality is. And reality on the ground is who can keep law and order. The first order of business for any government, regardless of what other things they believe. And the Taliban have been successful in that. And, well, they're going to keep being successful by the looks of it. And in which case, what do you want to do exactly? Like, you want, you want to sit here and be like, well, mm. I don't like it, so let's fund a rebel group to overthrow the country or something. Okay, great. Yeah, that's, it didn't learn our lesson the last few times, I suppose. And the alternative there for who is who are you going to fund to do that? Let's say if you're working at the Pentagon. Well, you've got ISIS or isis Light. Both of them considerably not friends, so it's, it's, it's just it's just silly. I just you occasionally see. I mean, Miles joked about this before. He used to post stuff about how great Afghanistan was, right? And then there'd be a bunch of Afghan liberals, usually people who never even visited the country, but now there's a lot of refu refugees, and they would post below how horrible it was that he was saying these things. And you can get mad about it, but just nothing's gonna change. Like you need to face up to reality. Reality isn't what you want it to be sometimes, and and that's what that place is. And what was frightening is that that was obvious for so long, and yet we kept it up. And what is their view, in your experience, the people in Afghanistan on the ground, of Biden and Trump? Because I think I remember you having a video about this. Yeah, so I spoke to the Taliban commander and asked him that question, uh, specifically, and a, a couple of other guys as well. I mean, in the Taliban movement, we didn't get to talk to too many like Taliban members, right? because uh, I didn't want to make too many friends, I suppose, just in case someone really didn't like me or something. There was a mixed feeling. I mean, neither of them, like... Sorry, neither of them are liked, for the obvious reason that they're the leader of the enemy. So, understandable. Um, amongst the average person, I don't think they really think about it too much, because why would they? I mean, there's some really funny stories you get out of that place. 
And apparently, sorry, it wasn't true. the the view though that they liked um, Biden better because he had basically left, and when when Trump's in, the feeling was he was going to be tougher and more likely to be tough on them. Was that was that right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Actually, I probably should mention that. So Trump was a very bad man. He kept his troops there. Why didn't he leave sooner? Whereas Biden, yeah, well, he left. So there's, you know, he's got good qualities. He's not oppressing us anymore. But he was also disliked because just before we arrived, there was a, bro- a drone strike against um, someone who's meant to be the leader of Al Qaeda after Bin Laden. And so there was, we were going to go and film that actually, find the apartment and film the the site. But then the the Western guy running the camp was like, "Boys, do you want to be arrested for, for being spies?" You gotta walk around with cameras around someone with uh, ah yeah that's, that's good at, yeah don't do that so you know some more advice but when it came to the average person I mean again like I was gonna say there's there's some funny stories about that place that soldiers would go up American soldiers into the rural parts and the locals would think they were Soviets and they'd be like what so like, you were Russians you're invaded right I'm like that's thirty years ago <laughs> were the Americans oh. What are you doing here? Twin Towers. What's that? Pulls out the phone. Show. Oh my god. It's terrible what Israel did to that building. No, 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 no. <laughs> and then you have to sit and explain to them like all world events that they've missed on the last 30 years. And um, Right. Sounds like a really edgy Monty Python sketch the way you do it. <laughs> but it's just the funny stories you get told about. Like the news just travels slower because it's a, it's a different part of the world. Sure, the capital and whatnot gets its international updates, and um, some of them I just thought were jokes about how rural the place could be. Apparently, a lot of them are just true, genuinely. And so, when it comes to what do you think about the newest president of the United States? Eh. I, I, I'm, right. They're still on like they still see Trump as like. <laughs> The 80s guy making his... Oh, he's doing well with real estate in New York. <laughs> Maybe he'll be a president someday. I don't know. That'll be funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Looking forward to season one of The Apprentice. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Wow, that's... Man, I can't believe all these, these things you've done. I mean, here's a question. It might annoy you because you're... Not annoy you, but you're sort of sick of some of the culture war stuff in England because it's your day job for Lotus Eaters. But going to all these countries, how has it changed your view of our little country, England or Britain? Um, yeah, so I mean, I came back after, I think, the Afghanistan trip, and I, I hate this place, um, genuinely. I started describing it as a minoritarian empire, because that's what it seems to be. The The West is definitely some kind of bubble that's all interconnected, especially the Anglosphere. It's been slowly encroached on by wokeism, which we've spoken about definitions before. I use the the term socialism on race, class, gender, etc. lines. And like the Soviets who would endlessly talk about the working class, there's only one side of that debate that's ever of interest to those folks. It's the minorities, but only certain kinds of minorities. It's the this race, but not that race, etc. And every one of our institutions, every part of our government, and every one of our companies bow down to this as a new age religion. And in which case, I don't want anything to do with that. I mean, our civilization is really cursed in a, in a bad way. Sure, we've got higher standards of living than, than most of the world. I don't know for how long. I was actually really miffed when I went through the UAE and realized just how poor we are and compared to them. That, that was a wake-up call. And then going to Serbia and Russia and whatnot, there's, there's a meme about them being like lands of purity and uh, not infected with such Western nonsense. It's, it's true to a large extent. They don't have that. Sure, they have their own problems. I'm not going to sit here and say like it's it's heaven on earth or something. No, they've got their own unique issues. But they, they do not have the religious nonsense that this part of the world lives under. And I, I, I just do not know what is wrong with our people in terms of... I don't know why anyone goes along with this. I mean, it's, it's on the face mad that you want to sit there and tell me that women have penises. I mean, that's just the funniest example, right? That's in the common culture... Everything else before was just as mad. But it just just ticks on somehow. I mean, I'm glad it's now not cool. People make fun of it constantly. And maybe that's the sign of it declining and we can get out of this mutt and, and get in something else. But I don't know. I, I'm really not pleased about this place. Uh, one of the things that, that I really, really hate as well is just the housing market. I, I'm not going to bore people with this, but the UK housing market is, is actually insane. If, if, if we think we're going to continue to have a country... 
with this as the situation. I mean, like, we're actually turning everyone into serfs through renting because no one can buy a house. I, I, it constantly makes me think... I, I got three options, basically. I'm thinking of either moving to like somewhere in the middle of the north where I could buy a house for 80 grand and just disappear. Because I, I, you know, I could get out of here, right? Still in England. I was looking at moving to Ireland, and then the third option is just like, just go to some Slavic place. I just refuse to learn the language and be a, an, an ignorant git. But I don't know, man. I, I'm not very happy about our part of the world after traveling. You would have to quit Lotus Eaters because it's not remote. But yeah, you, you could do something like that. You could do, because you get money from other sources, some of your online stuff. You could go to the north. But yeah, maybe it's because I sometimes think. I speak to a lot of people and they do feel quite bleak about the country. I wrote an article, England is lost forever. So, you know, I'm part of it as well. And I spoke to Francis Foss on this show. He felt we were in trouble. But then I also spoke to Jeff Norcott, who was much more optimistic. Might be because he's got a house and it might be a generational thing. I spoke to another friend of mine who's a, a comedian and he was, he's much more optimistic. But yeah, he's in his 50s and has a nice house that's worth about a million and a half. So could be that. Sometimes it could also be that you at the Lotus Eat is a, in a sort of hothouse environment of not sort of nihilistic young men. I wouldn't say nihilistic because really it's sort of like, in a way, thwarted idealism. You know, you're, you're looking at what you see and you're, you're upset about it, which is, which is valid. But maybe, just devil's advocate at least, it's not quite as bleak as you think. Though I do think your housing point is very relevant. And even me, I mean, I just, I'm older than you, but I just quit an extra job I was doing. I was trying to work seven days a week, including all day on the weekend till like 12 1 a.m and it's just it's a bit too much <laughs> mutual arrangement it's kind of like this is mad so and that was purely to try and get a house i was working two jobs to try and just get a mortgage and i've just gone but we're in a so-called property ice age so i wasn't getting anywhere anyway so i was kind of stuck um anyway so it's a long story but i i've, I've given up on the mortgage for myself i've just gone oh, i'll just give up on it because i'm working myself into the ground but yeah, that must be a huge problem. You, you're a young person. You just think, I'm never getting on this ladder. So yeah, I do get your, your sentiments on that. But it is genuinely mad. Like I'm, I'm 27. I've been, you know, as, as Scottish as I can with my money throughout all my life. Save like mad. Compared to most people my age, like I'm doing fantastic in terms of getting, that, getting myself in a position where I can buy a house. And then there are loads of people older than me who are way worse off as well. I just think, like, who... Who is doing well in this society? Speaking specifically about the UK, where basically no one can own property. And, and our circumstances are such purely, I believe, because of our immigration levels. I mean, the Canadians are getting... There was some graph of, like, income to house prices, blah, blah, blah. And the Canadians have gone mental recently, and that's a whole other conversation. And they're waking up to that. But ours is somehow even worse than theirs all over the country. And then you just look at young people in London, and you think... Like, you're actually a serf. You are never going to own anything around you. What is the point? Like, you work all day. Maybe you have a second job. I mean, even, you know, I'm sort of picky on you now. Because, you know, like, I'm working seven days a week at all hours. And it's just like, this isn't good. This this is a failed society if someone has to do that. And then they still can't get anywhere. I, and it, that, that makes me more blackpilled than anything, honestly. Yeah. You use the same phrase that Steve Bannon uses there. He always goes, you're like Russian serfs. He goes, you're better dressed, you're in better shape, okay? You look better, but you don't own, you own nothing and you're not going to own anything. And that's yeah. the thing. You're never going to have a stake in society. And I thought you were like 24, 25, 27. You're approaching 30 and you still can't do any of this stuff. So yeah, very bleak. I, it is bleak. I, I do get that. Sometimes I think it's not quite as bleak as you think. I think, can I make Callum see it's a bit better? But then again, I feel so bleak about it myself. I'm like, I'm not really helping but I thought if you went, you went to all these other countries, that might make you feel we have some things better, but it seems to have made you think we're actually worse than Af Is your position that we're worse than Russia and Afghanistan? He's having to think about it. <laughs> That's bad enough, isn't it? We've got higher... Long I mean, pause. Af Afghanistan's in a real difficult circumstance. So I mean, it's not really fair to compare them to anyone right now um, in terms of like the whole world kind of situation. Uh, with Russia, I mean... Or, or that's just not pick Russia. Let's just pick like the Eastern European countries in general, right? The Slavic world. Sure, their standards of living are, are lower. Sure, they um, might have to deal with more corruption and crime and stuff. You know, the, the traditional problems that we've always had and, and have somewhat overcome in the West. But the, I mean, the housing thing just makes me really think. Like, at least if you were living in Eastern Europe and young, you had a, f you've got a future. 
Like, you might actually be able to build up. If you, if you live in England, as you, end it. Like, what's... You're not going to be able to own anything. So, I mean, what really is the point? I mean, there just is no future in that regard. And... Yeah, that don't actually makes... end it, guys, but I see what you're saying. No, I mean, end the search for trying to... Um, oh. Get property, because it's it's just madness. Oh, yeah, I and misunderstood. It... Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> see how I'm feeling. No, I, yeah, <laughs> I gave up on the, that search as well. <laughs> but it, it's, it's... End it all, because you can't get a house. <laughs> but honestly, though, I mean, that is a real... Because if you're American, like the housing market over there, it still exists, and you can you can move on, and it's it's not that bad. But I mean, the UK situation is just so dire, and looking at the graphs, and so uniquely awful in terms of actually, can a young person reasonably find property? I don't know what to say. I may, maybe yeah, may, maybe having slightly lower standards of living, but not being a serf, is better. That's never been a, an option for humanity, has it? Lower your standards of living, but not be a serf, but. Yeah, Steve Bannon's right. Yeah. Steve Bannon's absolutely right. And I'm guessing you don't have much faith in any of our political parties because they seem to have done nothing about any of these problems. No, I mean, I mean, our system's uniquely buggered as well. There's a guy, I don't know if you watch him, he's called Tick, T-I-K, on YouTube. Okay, fantastic guy. I'll send you a video afterwards. He mostly talks about like World War II and socialism and stuff, right? But he's a historian by trade. So he looks at it through that lens. And he did a video recently going over Oswald Mosley, what he actually believed, why he did what he did, so forth. And to do that, you have to explain the Liberal Party, the Conservatives, and the Labour Party. And once you go through them and realise what they're actually for, in terms of who they defend, and that's their purpose for existing, you realise how buggered we really are. A lot of people describe the Conservative Party in the UK as like proto-leftists or, you know, secret progressives or something. I don't think this is actually accurate. I think that's because we've not seen them do anything against the progressive will, so we just assume they believe in it. I think Tick had it right. You've got the Labour Party, which is socialist, so waste of time. And then the Liberals, who brought into that in the late 1900s. You can go and see the, the evidence he has for that, which is true. But the Conservatives are kind of aristocrats, like literally just an aristocratic party. And once you see it through that lens, like, of course, they're happy to bend the knee for progressive nonsense, because doesn't affect them they're aristocrats why would they give a crap and at which point you're left with on the on the like reasonable parties that could get votes there's reform really excited about them but they're not having the luck they deserve at the moment so I, and what do they have to get i run it in the calculator the other day they have to get i think 30 percent of the vote or something like that to even get a handful of seats because of our voting system first past the post yeah i mean you can keep calling it a fair and free system but that, i mean it's not it's just not. I mean, like, a huge amount of the public, whenever you poll them, want this thing that no party's giving them. Okay, great. And it just it, That's been that way for, what, 30 years? There's actually some really funny stuff if you go back through every Conservative Party manifesto where they promised to bring down immigration. I just never have. And you just realise, okay, then. So, just... so presumably you want proportional representation, then? Yeah. Yeah, if you're going to be a democ... If you're going to be some kind of republic, do it. I mean, the Americans have their own unique circumstances for why they should be what they are. It's got some downsides, but it's generally better than what we are. Um, I, mean, I don't hugely believe in republics and democracies, but it, you know, if that's what you're going to do, actually do it. Don't have this this lie we live under, where it's like, oh, this is a, a free and democratic system. It's like, well, it's not really. You got three options, and if you're not served by them, you can just leave. And that's you might be say, oh, that's okay for extremists, but I mean, like the majority of the public keep asking for a lot of things that never keep getting served. So, I mean, if the majority of the public are extremists, then I don't know what yep. extremist is. All right, Callum had a slight issue with his uh, internet connection there, but he was just basically saying he wanted proportional representation, and then he was just disavowing democracy and the West <laughs> <laughs> and, and his country, and basically everything else. The listener can make up their own mind. Um, I don't know, Swiss you know Switzerland's got wait. it right, just we haven't, all right? <laughs> okay, that's fair enough. And what So... I sometimes ask this question, it may, may have been answered by your previous answers, but I sometimes say, how do we win this so-called culture war? But I'm guessing it sounds like you don't even think we can win it. No, I think you can. I'm actually kind of annoyed because I asked Peter Whittle essentially that question once. It was a, the Battle of Ideas event, and someone was talking about, you know, oh, should we fight Gillette when they make these adverts? And Peter gave a great answer, which is just like, yeah, of course, why wouldn't you? Like, you, you don't buy their products because they're literally declaring war on you. 
So, duh. And then I asked him, well, okay, at what point do you make peace with Gillette after they've gone on some anti-male tirade? And he didn't have an answer and no one else did on the panel. Which is kind of annoying because it's all great to fight a culture war, but you kind of have to win the peace. Because if you don't win the peace, what was the point? And the correct answer to that is when Gillette starts singing your praises instead. When Gillette start making adverts about how not only is this razor made for men and should be for men, but also the um, patriarchy is a good thing, uh, the uh, <laughs> socialists need to be deported as criminals. <laughs> so far, I'm joking. But once they come around to your position, that's when you give up the boycott. Max and... 3, the, the only choice for patriarchs. <laughs> I can see that happening. But it's, it's, yeah, it's just something he didn't answer, which confused me. And so, yeah, I think you can win. And the deal you make with those companies to win it, you know, on a company basis, it's easy. The government level is just an expansion of that, I suppose. But on a, on a company level, it's just when that company stops doing the thing that's actively against you and instead starts endorsing you, that's when you go back to them. I mean, if they never get involved with any of this, you just buy their products anyway, and we can have capitalism and everyone can be happy for once instead of having to deal with this. But Imagine that. Used to work. That's not the world we live in, yeah. I know. Gillette, the best a man can get. It was simpler times. You were a man. You wanted to use a razor. You were manly. It was all you know, it was pretty simple. But there was an ideology sort of behind it, which we didn't realize in a sense. Not an ideology, but there was a basic assumption that manliness is in some way a good thing for men, <laughs> which we <laughs> thought was just normal. That turned out to be a political statement. But it is switching a little bit. If you look at the response to Kelly J. Keane getting attacked in, in New Zealand and the sort of, you know, the World Athletics ban on trans people. I know these are sort of small, not really wins. They're just going back to sort of some sanity. But especially on the gender issue, there does seem to be some progress. Nicola Sturgeon fell apart, et cetera, et cetera. So on that issue, I do see, a, you know, minor wins. Yeah, it's true. And, and it should be celebrated. Anyone who just thinks it's completely pointless, then... I think you're wrong, even with all the black pulling I am. It, it's just, you actually have yeah. to have a strategy. Like, wh when are you going to take the W? Like, just calm down and take the W for once. That That's something I don't see people talking about and, and should be in their heads. Yeah, that was the most positive thing you said the whole podcast. Um, and just, just sort of finally, what is the goal for your work? Because you, despite some of the things you've said that sound quite bleak, you're obviously quite motivated. You go out to Afghanistan and Russia and you make all these great videos. What are, you, what are you sort of trying to do with all your work? Educate people. Uh, honestly, the, the I don't know about you, but the biggest rush I get in terms of like feeling good uh, is uploading the video and seeing the comments. Um, if people are ever watching my stuff, leave comments. I love them. All of them. I've, I've read pretty much every one. Like literally every single comment that's ever been written on my channel. Because it's it's nice to see people seeing what you've seen and actually taking something away from it. There are a lot, you know, occasionally you get people who just go like uh, KYS, F word. <laughs> Which, I don't know, I just, I kind of find the abuse funny. But showing people something and having them appreciate that fact is, is just really rewarding for me. So that's that's the main thing. I, I, I love getting out of it. Um, entertainment, entertaining people is also just good fun. I just love people when enjoying your jokes and stuff. I'm sure you get that as a comic. Like, I imagine you've done really good sets, and you, you enjoy the fact that you've got a whole room of people laughing. And over the internet, it's a bit weirder because it's you know it's just random strangers leaving comments, but it's probably similar, I imagine. As for what I want to do, well, with nothing's it, I don't quite know. replaced that for me. But go on. Yeah, I imagine being in person, it's it's a hugely when you're on stage experience. and you're smashing it, and the yeah. whole 400 people, whatever it is, love you. That you feel briefly like briefly happy, or the absence of pain, at least. <laughs> It's much harder to get that with a, <laughs> with a podcast. People will Nick say Dixon's like the really one nice time thing. I was happy. Yeah, yeah. It's it's more like I'm just I'm just in the moment, so I don't notice that I'm unhappy. But the rest of the time, the the, the substitute for that is the really nice reviews we got on this podcast. And please leave a nice review. But yeah, it's not quite the same. But it, it it's I still like it. But yeah, my thing. Okay. I discussed it on my other podcast with Toby. I'll never be happy, but I'm making other people happy, and that's that's maybe enough. So I mean, yeah, that's that's the great fun you get out of it. As for in terms of content, I mean, I have got a bit of a problem. I mean, a friend of mine said to me off Afghanistan, I mean, there won't be many of those, are there? I'm like, ah, yeah, you are right. So, there's, there, I mean, yes, there's a few more... Uh... It, it's not just red countries for the sake of it either. I, I don't want to go somewhere that's dangerous just because it's dangerous. Um, in fact, Miles did invite me to Snake Island with him. And I was like, I texted back, like, why? 
He says, well, there's loads of snakes. It'll be dangerous. I'm like, why? <laughs> that hasn't answered my question. So Right, that's what I, I mean. mean. That's I the difference between liking danger for its own sake versus what you're doing. Well, I think I think he likes the danger and he he likes going to like really remote places. I'm not so keen on the remote stuff. I'm more in keen on the, the human populated areas of the world. So I've also got to find it interesting. So, I mean, there, there are quite a few parts of Europe left that I still find are probably worth visiting that are interesting. I don't know if I want to be traveling forever. Um, I don't want to take Bold and Bankrupt's spot. I think he's doing great. So there's that. Uh, other than that, I mean, I, I used to, I used to make before I did the traveling videos just other videos about ideas or politics or dumbass music, right? There's actually a, a so I've got a subscribe star where people pay me money and that's how I pay for this stuff, right? And on the the description of my channel is just I make what I want. Hopefully you like it. No promises. So yeah, I saw that's a very calm that's description. It really. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, it, it's, All right, that's it really. Yeah, I think that's good enough. And and your YouTube's growing incredibly fast. I mean, it's on 84.4 thousand last I saw, but you don't even make that many videos. I mean, if you're posting every day, but you post like every month or something, is it just because the videos are so unique and so good, like tourism in Afghanistan? Probably, in, in that regard, to be honest. I, I had a YouTube channel before, this one as well, so I got pretty used to knowing what works, what doesn't. So no. I've got that. And you're quite analytical. And Haven't you got a physics degree? Yeah. Um, I don't know how much yeah, that helps. So it helps to be... But... It helps well. You does it mean you're smart and you're vaguely sciencey. Some of us are just creative, artsy types and we struggle with all the, you know, analytics and some of the tech side of it. You seem to have all that sorted. Um, yeah, I mean, this is going to sound really weird. Well. But one of my big passions is actually the editing. It's the most, like, annoying part of the process. Like, it's the bar... It's the, it feels like a chore the whole time and you don't like doing it. But it's the part I, I really appreciate the most... And I, I, I need to make like a, probably a video essay on this topic or something. I really think video editing is an art and I can't stand it when I see especially YouTubers I love hire some editor to do all their work for them because they don't want to do that part anymore because it takes so much away from the video. The video is not just you spouting the camera. The, the images that come on screen, the decisions about what kind of animations you make, the cuts you make, so forth and so forth. Like they're really the cool part for me, in terms of bringing it alive, and especially when you see someone decide that they're just going to hire an editor and they can do it all for them, I, I'm not talking about like um, you know a couple of clippings or whatever, right? But like proper animated stuff or something like that, like a full project. Y you lose so much because it's you're now in the hands of two people instead of that one which you fell in love with in the channel. And so when I'm editing or learning new editing things, I that 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 really gets me. Like, I remember when I learned to do this map stuff that I've started using a lot in the travel videos. So you've got this camera perspective that's, like, over the earth and you can show the different countries and whatnot. That's really cool for me. I spent, like, 300 quid on that plugin just because I like it so much. And, yeah, that, that that's that's something that really gets to me. But also, I firmly believe if you spend enough time on the editing, especially if you're building, like, a proper structured animated project, it will be better. And if you just make good stuff, they will come. Sure, you might have to sit there unnoticed for like a year or two years, but once people start noticing that you make really high quality stuff, they're going to hit subscribe. They're going to want to see more. Whereas if you just spout out like, eh, like you, you did some editing to make some kind of animated, but it's not good. What was the point? Sure, you can make like low effort, really cool stuff. And there is really high effort crap stuff. But if you make really high effort and it's good, that's, that's gold. That's absolute gold. And that doesn't get appreciated enough, I don't think. Hmm. That's what I need to work on on this channel. We've got great content in terms of the conversations, but the videos, we need to work on all that and all the presentation well, side of it. To be fair, this is a chat format, so it's a bit different. I'm talking more about like a, a piece to camera yeah. or a explanation of a thing. That's really where you can actually do proper editing. You can't really do that with chatting because it's chat. Right, right. Yeah, did you? I mean, it reminds me of people like Walter Murch, that the editor. Do you remember him? Of the, you edited The Godfather and things like that. He had a book called In the Blink of an Eye, and you knew that if he edited, edited a film, it's going to be good, basically. Yeah, there are some people who are really talented at it, and, and they really don't seem to get appreciated. And like I said, I mean, there are some YouTubers, I won't name names, who hired an editor, and then the, because they don't do the editing anymore, their videos all of a sudden just became really long and rambly because 
they're not cutting out the bits that are pointless anymore. They're not cutting down their scripts because they know, oh crap, I'm going to have to sit and edit that. I, it really does mess with the <laughs> the format in a big way and people don't seem to appreciate it. Yeah, all right, cool. I'm, I'm glad you're so passionate about your work and it's certainly paying off. And um, I think we've probably done enough there. We've gone way over an hour. So just quickly, since we've talked about your channel so much, where can people find you? Where's the best place for you? So I've got a YouTube channel. It's called Britannica Politica. I'm probably going to change that name if you've got any suggestions, Nick. I might just drop the Politica and just keep Britannica. Callum, the... whenever I type it in, it auto-completes to Britannica Political. And obviously, no one knows what it is or can spell it, <laughs> but it finds yeah, it like, anyway. It was literally just a place name, and, I, and I'm just like, uh, yeah, I was going to change that, wasn't I? Uh, just call it crap. Callum or something, or Callum's Travels or not that, but something less cringe well, on those lines. Yeah, I mean, there's the problems with that as well. There's so many other goddamn Callums. I mean, there's a guy who follows me, Callum Abroad. He just goes around. Nice guy. Um, does traveling to like Pakistan and you know weird places like that, right? So you don't want to do that. Maybe I'll just change mm. it to Politica. Sorry, Britannica. But yeah, Britannica Politica. If if you like it enough that you think you want to see more, subscribe and subscribe star. If I don't have those subscriptions, I literally can't pay for it. I mean, like the the Afghan video alone. What did that cost me? I think it was like six, seven grand in total for that one. And then you've got to make that back, otherwise it, you can't do more of them. So that's how. Yeah, and I'm just all right. So they can go to Britannica Politica, and they can go to your subscribe star, which is what subscribe same star name. Callum something. Oh, same, same name. name. And then, uh, or is it? And Callum? I'm just checking the Twitter, which is at Twitter is at Akad Secretary. Because you, you used to be Carl's secretary, so that's still that. But it's Callum at ACAD secretary, A-K-K-A-D secretary. So that's... And you're doing well there. you got more followers than me. So, um, all right. Thanks, man. Hopefully some people will go and check it out. Although most of them will know you anyway, but hopefully you'll get some more. And uh, thanks for doing the podcast. I'll put in all my things later when I overdub so you don't have to sit here while I do it. And uh, all right. Thanks for doing this. No problem, man. Well, I'll come back to learn more about the current thing. <laughs> it's actually a really cool. good title. <laughs>